Oh man, Dave Coulier is here. What's going on, man? How are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine shake. shaking. Yeah. I never know if people want to shake or not. Good. How are you guys doing? Good to see you. Good. Good to see you too. Good. I never know if people want to shake. I, I don't mind it, but some people just hate it. And people even before COVID, it was bad. But in, like after COVID, some people just don't want to touch at all. Yeah, I don't throw up on people. That's what I don't oh, do right. anymore. That's good. You know, you is it okay if I puke? Is sure. it okay? Do <laughs> you mind? Just a little, not a lot. You know. You got to draw your lines that's, where you can draw them. You know. Right. Is that what finally made you quit drinking? Was it the vomiting? The vomiting is is probably the worst part of it. I wasn't a I wasn't a puker. No. I wasn't. You know, I was just a, a blanker outer, you know, to where people go, you were so funny last night. Did you ever get those underpants off your head? Yeah. yeah. You know, so it was like, I don't remember that. I have full pockets of time in my life that are just gone. Yeah. yeah. That's probably worse than losing your lunch, losing time from your life. Yeah. That's you know? terrifying, too. It's terrifying. And I was, I was a faller, you know, where, you know, and I was always... I've been a hockey player my whole life, so I'm always the final, final, final guy sitting around with the guys after the game, having beers. You know, I was that guy. And uh, I would fall. And, like, the last time I fell, my wife was out of town, and a buddy of mine laughed. And he goes, oh, that's going to leave a mark. And I looked, and he took a picture, and he goes, you got to send that to your wife because Melissa's coming home in two days, and that's not going to heal up. (laughs) And I said, okay. So I sent it to her, and she just screamed and started crying, and I realized, okay, i got to take a second look at this. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, when your loved ones are screaming. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's when it's time to start thinking about your... It's time. When a photo of you makes them cry, (laughs) Yeah. which for me is normally when I send it nude. Uh, (laughs) Do you? uh, Would she be on you all the time like, hey, you got to stop, you got to stop, or no? No, no, no. I I got the best wife in the world. She uh, just, you know, is concerned, but uh, when I quit drinking, she quit drinking. She's like, you know, oh, I'm gonna great. support you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, no more wine with dinner or anything. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stick close to you on this. So she's been really supportive. It's been great. Was it yeah. difficult, like, to to get through, or once you were once you were there, were you there? It led up. I, there was like a year of leading up to it, where I was like, I got to make some changes. But it took me a year to kind of discover like relationships that had kind of frayed at the edges and my creativity wasn't there and I didn't feel like jumping up on stage and just, you know, things, it had diminishing returns. Mm-hmm. So it took me about a year to kind of figure all that out and kind of com- compartmentalize everything. Like, am I going to be funny again? Yeah. Am I going to be like the final, final guy who's funny with everybody? And I, I that was the thing I worried about the most was, am I going to be funny? And yeah. so... You know, I processed all that, and then I just decided January 1st, 2020, that's it. I'm Did you ever blackout during a show? I, I never went on drunk. Did you ever, ever blackout, like, mid-show? What, I what happened? did. I was, yes, I did. I was at uh, Yuck Yucks in Vancouver, and uh, first show right out of the gate. And the night before, I'd been out drinking with uh, some of the Detroit Red Wings staff. And we were talking hockey till 5 in the morning, and then I had two shows that night. Oh. And I'm about five minutes into my set and just I heard this high-pitched hum in my head couldn't remember the next line and I just said to the audience hold on just one second I went behind the curtain and they have that microphone where they introduce the next comic standing back there so I started blowing hand farts into the microphone (laughs) listening to the audience laugh and I'm panicking going what do I say next so so the opening comic comes over and I go go grab in my bag in the comics room, grabbed my my uh, uh, piece of paper, and it had my set written on it. So he we went and he grabbed that, and I went, oh, my God, I'm only five minutes <laughs> in. And I walked back out, and some of my friends who were there said, that thing you did where you walked backstage and were blowing farts is the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. I said, I don't think I'll be doing that bit again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's a panic move. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right, right. Yeah. Is it also like, I mean, it's got to be more pressure for you too because it's not just like you know this famous comedian blacked out on stage at yuck yucks what you don't want is like hey what's joey from full house up to oh he blacked out on stage at yuck yucks you know it becomes a much bigger story because of kind of who you are yeah and i said to my wife melissa i said hey you know i'm gonna post this picture just because i'm tired of like not telling people about it and i just feel like so what you know, yeah, it's who yeah, I yeah. am. It's where I've been. Yep. I was a, I was a drinker. Yeah. You know, I was an alcoholic. And so she said, well, just get ready. And I go, I don't think anybody's going to care. She goes, just get ready. I'm telling you. And it just kind of opened up this whole new world of people perceiving me in a different way. 
But it's I'm probably positive, right? People are probably supportive. Like, hey, unbelievable. Yeah. Jim, yeah. It, Jim, it was it was amazing. And you know, I I don't like to be preachy or pious about it. You know, I'll buy my buddy shots, you know, when we're sitting around. I don't I don't mind that. But if somebody can just see themselves in my story and go, well, if that guy can, you know, be abused by alcohol, um, maybe I can maybe I can find sobriety too. So I mean, you know, everybody's on a different totally different level and different point in their life. You yeah. Know? When did you realize, because like you were part of not just Full House, but like so many things that I, I don't even know if people like realize, like, you know, the, the Ghostbusters cartoon and Muppet Babies, even for me, like <laughs> out of control, like when I was a little kid before Full House came on and when Full House came on, you were the guy from out of control to me. That show, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I want to hear about Out of Control. That show was such a gift. I was 23 years old, and I was about to do The Tonight Show, my first one with Johnny Carson hosting. And I was, you know, you're not real confident as a young comic, you know, especially when that's kind of the only show for comedians, you know. And then I got this series, Out of Control, and the producer, Bob Hughes, said, we're going to let you improv. We're going to let you just, you're going to host this, but whatever you want to do. And I thought this is like being in a comedy toy box where you can play with any kind of toy you want. And I learned how to be a TV comedian. You know, it was really where it was like, you know, comedy college for me. It was great. You know, it was interesting because at the time, like it was on Nickelodeon, right? That's, yeah. But you could, you could, I feel like in the eighties there shows that were targeted for kids. You could still, it wasn't so like, you know, Hey there, little guy. We're gonna like right. you could actually do stuff that would apply to your real comedy career. We weren't selling toys, right? We were not. You know, there was no marketing team. There was, you know, it was Nickelodeon based in Canada at the time, and they left us alone. So we were cranking out these shows down in L.A., and it was just me and the cast improving our way through funny sketches. That's awesome. How did how did the Tonight Show set go? I was scared to death. I was scared to death. And I had gone with Shandling to his first eight Tonight Shows, and Gary and I used to punch up his sets and stuff. So I kind of knew my way around there with, you know, Peter LaSalle and Jim McCauley. You know, they knew who I was. I was this young kid who wrote with Gary. And so I kind of knew my way around the Tonight Show. And then I was sitting with Shandling at the Improv one night, and uh, Jim McCauley comes over. He goes, I saw your set. You're on the show Thursday. I said, Jim, there's no way. Wow. I'm, not, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And Gary goes, Dave, you have to do the show. <laughs> and I said, Gary, I'm not ready. He goes, you're ready. You're ready. You're ready. And so um, he said, I already spoke to Brad, who was Brad Gray, who was our manager. And uh, he said, you're on the show. So I'll see you. I'll see you on Monday and we'll go over your set. And I was terrified because I really was not a Tonight Show comic. Mm -hmm. You know, guys who are can craft a joke, you know, like Shandling and... Stephen Wright and Jerry Seinfeld. I mean, those guys are yeah. so good at what they do. And I was a guy who was, you know, I'm going to do Joe Pesci. Okay, okay, okay. And I'm going to do five yeah. minutes as Joe Pesci, you know. So they kind of corralled my set and tried to make me a Tonight Show comic. I got the okay from Johnny, but I, they really didn't like what I did very much. Because mm -hmm. I was doing sound effects and voices and you know, and it was just kind of what I did on stage at the time, you know, because my focus was really, I want to be an actor. I want to be on a sitcom. I want to keep doing voices. And so that's what I was doing on stage. But what's interesting is like that was also the era where like they would try to take your act and turn it into a sitcom and, and you know, like Roseanne. And they did it with Seinfeld too and everything. But when you got on to Full House, you were doing a lot of your stuff as the character, right? Or kind of, you know. Which was great. The producers were so gracious that way. They came out to uh, Igby's in Santa Monica and watched my set. And so they incorporated, they said, oh, we want to do some of those funny voices and things that you do into the show. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. Yeah. Did you, Cut It Out was yours? No, I stole Cut It Out. Did and, you? And I'll tell you who I stole it from. He's my uh, oldest, longest childhood friend. His name is Mark Sandrowski. We, we met in third grade. Mm-hmm. Uh, back in Detroit, and uh, he has directed every episode of The Big Bang Theory. Wow. He's, he's a big television director. So we were thick as thieves as kids, and he and his brother used to do a, a comedy duo called Ski Squared. And uh, they had some really funny stuff, but he would do this lounge singer like Bill Murray, 
and he would pull his shirt open and show his nipple to some lady in the front row. He goes, I know what you're looking at now. Cut it out. I told him, I said, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> and, you know, so he said, oh, you owe me. You owe me. I go, oh, get, shut up. You, you're like the biggest TV director on the planet. Knock it off. You got plenty of cash. <laughs> yeah. Give me this. Give me this. Yeah. What was the, when you went to Full House, was there a period of time between Out of Control and Full House, or did you just go right from one to the other? There was, yeah. In fact, um, I went on the road and... Uh, you know, because I thought, well, I guess I'm going to be a comic until. So I, I, you know, I did some, I guested on New Heart and Family Ties and did a Cheech and Chong movie called Things Are Tough All Over. So there were little jobs here and there. And then I auditioned for SNL and did my screen test at NBC. And uh, Brad Gray called me and he said, you know, I, I just talked to uh, I just talked to Lauren, Dave, and he says uh, it's going to be great having Dave with us in New York this year as a as a featured player. And so, you know, I was going to New York to be on Saturday Night Live. And so I told everybody in my life, of course, uh -huh. you know, all the comics knew it. Like, <laughs> wow, you're going to New York. You're on SNL. And I'm like, yeah, can you believe it? Told everybody I knew, my family, boxed up everything in my apartment. And then like uh, 10 days go by and I don't hear anything. And I'm trying to find an apartment in New York. And... <laughs> I'm ready to go. And then I get a call from Brad and he says, uh, listen, I got some bad news. I'm like, what could be bad? I didn't find an apartment. And he says, no, you're not going. And I said, why? And he said, because I just talked to Brandon Tartikoff and Brandon thinks you and Dana Carvey are too similar. Oh. So I had to call everybody in my life oh. and say, I'm not going. I wasn't lying. I really was going. <laughs> And I luckily got my apartment back, unpacked everything, and then about a year later, I got the Full House script. Was and every, that year, before you got Full House, when Dana Carvey was on SNL, were you just grinding your teeth every no, time I he was Dana. on? No, I love Dana. No, I love comics. You know, I, I, if somebody's successful, I'm so happy for them because it's so tough what we do. Yeah. That I'm happy when a comic is, is exploding, you know? Because I know how much work that is. And I know how hard Dana worked because we would cross each other at the clubs all the time. And so I was happy for him. You know, I was just thinking, wow, I am such a loser. <laughs> like, what's next? And then I was, you know, given that script for Full House and boom. And then I, I got it. And I thought, well, why was that so easy? <laughs> Did you, after Full House is done... Because that's, I mean, you know, such a huge thing. It's like it's defining you for so many people. What do you do? Like, how do you kind of get into this place where you're like, okay, I'm going to figure out what life is like beyond this? I had uh, four shows canceled all at the same time. Real, Go Real Ghostbusters, uh, Muppet Babies, America's Funniest People, and uh, Full House. All ended at the same time. And I was so burned out by that time. I was on stage in Detroit, Michigan at a place called Pine Knob. Me and uh, Dennis Miller were co-headlining. And I walked off from that set being so burned out. I just thought, this is it. I'm canceling all my stand-up dates. I'm burned out. I have nothing funny to say uh, after eight years. And um, so I did. I canceled my dates. And I walked off and I just said, I can't do this for a while. So from that respect, it was kind of a self-chosen decision. Yeah. Um, and I had just gone through a divorce, and my little boy, Luke, was just a little guy. He was only like uh, four years old. So I thought, I'm just going to be a dad, and I'm going to take time off, and I'm going to throw a baseball with him and ride bikes and just be a dad. So I did that. And then I had to kind of decide, okay, what's next? When you... Uh... So you got like like all these people looking at you a certain way, whether it's you know Ghostbusters or Full House or any of this stuff, and you're a dad and you're doing all this stuff, and then these Alanis Morissette rumors start rearing their ugly head. Are you going like I really, I don't need this out there right now, or are you like yeah, this is, it is what it is. It was what it was. Yeah, you know we dated and she was writing all of that jagged little pill stuff during that time, and and I never saw this you know angry white girl thing that she's you know, that people have kind of coined her as. I never saw that. She was funny. She was sweet. She was super intelligent, super talented. Um, 
So I never I never saw that, but when people would, you know, that was 95 when Jagged Little Pill came out, and uh, I started, here's the story. I'm driving in Detroit, and I've got my radio on, and I hear the hook for You Ought to Know, come on the radio, and I'm like, wow, this is a really cool hook. And then I start hearing the voice, I'm like, wow, this girl can sing. And I had no idea, you know, that, that this was the record. And hey, I uh, gave someone a cross. And then I, <laughs> and then I was like, uh, I'm listening to the lyrics, going, "Ooh, oh no, oh, I can't be this guy." And I went to the record store, bought the CD, and I went and I parked on a street and I listened to the whole record. And there was a lot of familiar stuff in there that her and I had talked about, like your your shake is like a fish. You know, I'd go, hey, dead fish me, you know, and we'd do this dead fish handshake. And and so I started listening to it and I thought, ooh, I think I may have really hurt this woman. And that was my first thought. And so years later, we reconnected and uh, she couldn't have been sweeter. And I said, what do you want me to say when people ask me about this relationship? And she said, you can say whatever you want. So she was really sweet about it. She was kind. Um I'll tell you the kind of person she is. When my sister Sharon was dying with cancer, Alanis was living in Toronto. My sister was in Detroit. She actually drove to Detroit with her guitar and sat with my sister playing songs and singing to my sister in the hospital. Wow. That's that's the kind of human being she is. So I've never had anything bad to say about her. She's lovely. What uh, Now, when you were in that theater that she references, what movie were you watching? You know, you... (laughs) You do that. Uh, you do that popcorn cup trick <laughs> one time, and it backfires on you. You know, it is, it is ironic. As we, uh, I, by the way, that was not a pun. Oh. I did I do that on purpose. I didn't do that on purpose. I'm going to rephrase my question because I didn't you do that on purpose. Uh, no, nothing. I didn't say anything. I'm not doing it again. I, I was, but it's like fact, we have a full house in here. There it is. Out loud. But it's like, of course, it becomes the most iconic. Breakup song. You, everything you do, it feels like there's. The, it becomes iconic, right? You're you're just a part of so much iconography it's, in uh, American entertainment. It's kind of unbelievable. Purely unintentional, right? Purely, you know. I guess I mean, you're just an incredible person. Well, you can't. It's <laughs> it's tough to write your own story, yeah. you know. And yeah. my That's story's kind of been written for me in a lot of ways. So it's just kind of like, well, ride through that story the best you can. Yeah, I wrote my own story and I auditioned for it and I didn't get it. <laughs> I stink. <laughs> was there ever when you were? Were you, you? Did you still do stand up while Full House was on? I was. Yeah, I was doing. I was doing stand up. Did you? Was there ever any trouble with that? Like, were people looking for the stuff from the show when they went to see you, or were audiences generally cool about? No, they were cool. They yeah, were, they were really cool. You know. And then there was a period where I just I couldn't get work. You know, I was the guy from Full House, and things had changed in television by that time, and. Uh, you know, couldn't get arrested. And then you get over that hump and all of a sudden everything's new. Everything that was old is new. And yeah. And you know, I've always looked at this as cyclical and a roller coaster ride. And you know, um, just, just if you're in for the long haul, which I always said I would be, uh, through the good and through the bad, you know, just ride it through as long as it's still fun. If it's still fun, keep doing it. And if it's not do something else. Yeah. We should plug the show properly. Uh, it's called Live and Local. It's uh, available exclusively on Pure Flix. New episodes every Thursday. And uh, where Pure Flix, is that every, how do you see Pure Flix? I don't know anything about it. Go to pureflix.com. Okay. Yeah, it's a new streamer, so people don't know about it, and that's my job. So uh, it's a new streamer. Uh, Sony Affirm is the, you know, the uh, studio. And uh, they are streaming everything on uh, on Pure Flix, and it has kind of a faith based message. Not necessarily. Uh, they're trying to do more family oriented stuff, not so much heavy, right? Faith based stuff, you know. Because me, even me as a, you know, as a viewer, if it's like, okay, we pan down from a sorrowful picture of Jesus. Okay, <laughs> is this gonna be funny? Yeah, right. you know. So, so it is funny, and that's all kind of just working in the background. So uh, my hat's off to them that that's what they're trying to do now. Um, so it's been a it's been a really fun show. <laughs> yes, and I think that's it for us today. That's our show. Yes, we're done. <laughs>